Well, Isaiah chapter 10 has some very profound advice for us in our day. This is talking about, again, this is that dualism we talked about in chapter 7. So he's literally describing things that are going to be happening in their age with Assyria. But it also has very direct relevance to our day and age, symbolically. So there's a dualism again that's, that's coming out. So this is okay to think about. So let's get in and understand this. In fact, uh, 2 Nephi chapter 20 goes along with this. And this is super, super important. Again, this is last day's prophecy. If you've ever wondered what is going to be the destruction of the end of the world, how is all this going to wrap itself up, this chapter, Isaiah 10 or 2 Nephi 20, is going to give us a lot of tips and advice. So if you ever see somebody claiming they're telling you what the destruction of the end of the world is and they're not using these chapters, they are missing a major point that God is giving us. These are very important for us to think about. So verse 1, okay, and again, think about this. This is what's going to happen to the nation of Assyria. But this is a type and shadow of what is going to happen to the wicked in the last days. So just just before the millennium, basically. Verse 1, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that write grievousness which they have prescribed. So what this means, basically, this is, he nearly has a little commentary on this part from his book, Old Testament Related Studies. He says, Everything is rigged. Everybody is on the take. The heart of the city is full of murder. The princes are rebellious, the companions of thieves. Even when right is plainly on his side, the poor man does not stand a chance. So decree unrighteous decrees, you're making unjust laws. You're making laws that, that hurt righteous and allow wickedness to spread more. Uh, they write grievousness, which they have prescribed. Again, you're making it harder for the good people to be good and make it easier for the bad people to be bad. This is total corruption in government, basically. So verse 2, and this is what's happening, this is what's happening in Israel and Syria in these places, and in us Syria too. And this is what's what's going on. Verse 2, turn aside the, to turn aside the needy from judgment, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, that they may rob the fatherless. So let's talk about chat, uh, verse 2 here for a second. So if you turn aside the needy from judgment, basically, or justice you are making it hard for them to seek justice. They need justice. They have been hurt. But because of the laws, protect the wealthy, protect the greedy, the just, the needy, the people who need judgment can't find it in the courts. The courts are rigged, basically. And so before you get on a high horse of this is this party or this is that party or, oh my gosh, this is so crazy, this isn't about party. This is righteousness and wickedness. It doesn't matter political party. Both of them have problems, okay? Both of them could fit into this category. So I understand it's more abject wickedness rather than political party type stuff. So another one is take away the right from the poor of my people. So again, you, you steal people's rights from them so they can't function. They can't make choices. You're taking their choices away from them. Uh, that the widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. So basically, how can we take more money out of the poor people's hands and put it in the wealthy? So laws do this eventually. Nations do this where people get greedy. They realize, hey, I can change the rules and make myself wealthier and use the rules to protect my wealth. And basically the poor get screwed. And that's what's going on in Assyria, basically. And it's a sign of the destruction and the abject problems in the nation as well as the end of days, what's going to happen. So verse 3, And what will ye do in the day of visitation, and in the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will ye flee for help, and where will ye leave your glory? So this is basically, other translations say, where will you hide your treasure? Where are you going to go? Everything is being destroyed. They're being overrun. What are you going to do with your own wealth? It's going to go. They're going to get it. You can't hide it. Verse 4, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners. They shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. There's that mercy again. Mercy. So even though these people are wicked, they have left God, ignored God, going the opposite of God, he's still there to help them. So verse 5, 
O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Staff means power or right to rule. Uh, so this is talking to the Assyrians here. Now, in Hugh Nibley's Old Testament related studies, he had this to say. He said, the Assyrians guaranteed them security. When the Syrians came in to destroy him, they guaranteed him security. They were the top nation militarily. Go along with us, they said to Jerusalem, and Isaiah has preserved their letters, and you will be safe. You are fools. How can God deliver you if you have no army? You need us. God is on the side of the big battalions. This is what is called real politic, which has repeatedly destroyed its practitioners in modern times. When Isaiah tells the people to trust God and not Egypt, the people say that that is not realistic. So here, so here come the Assyrians, those super realists with their irresistible might, and they were wiped out in their camp as they were sleeping. The great nations, all nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him as less than nothing and vanity because they pretend to be something. There is only one in whom you can put your trust. Assyria vanished overnight and was never heard of again, while lesser nations as ancient as, ancient as Assyria, who could not afford to gamble for supremacy on the winning of battles, are still with us. So he nearly points out some really fascinating things for us to think about here, because we know from our day and age, Assyria grows to be a big nation and then gets destroyed, never heard of again. They're lost in history. Now we know a lot about them, but that nation is not around today. Well, there's other nations. Egypt is older than Assyria by a lot, and it's still around today. Syria actually still exists as a country today. Israel is a country again today. They were back then, they went away for a while, then they came back. There are still nations out there today that have been around since these times, but Assyria is not one of them, even though they were a world power. They grew, and then they fell. So that's the challenge that is going on with this. So verse 6, I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge, to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So this is absolutely important for us to understand. Assyria, a non-God-fearing nation, at least the God of Israel-fearing nation, is going to come in and take out the Israelite nation that has gone apostate, basically, a hypocritical nation. So that's what's going to happen. Okay, This is that prophecy of Assyria wiping the northern kingdoms out. Um, the thing that's so important for us to understand here, this is not the righteous called to fight the wicked. God uses the wicked to fight the wicked. Very important point. Very important point for us to understand. So verse 7, How be it he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. So this is he's, this is in the intent, it's Assyrians' intent as well. Verse 8, For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno as Carchemish? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? So they're going to be destroyed. So these are the cities Assyria has conquered on their way to Israel, basically. And Samaria... Samaria is going to be like Damascus. So Syria got wiped out. Now the northern kingdoms are about to get wiped out. Verse 10, As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. So let's think about that for a second. My hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. So the kingdom of the, of the idols, these are the these are the uh, heathen nations, it would be called. These are the non-Israelite nations that worship false gods like Enlil and, and uh, a lot of these other ones. I just forgot the uh, common Assyrian one. Sorry, Enlil, I think, was a Babylonian one. Uh, or Akkadian, excuse me. Um, and he's saying, look, they, they excelled even the graven images in Jerusalem, which is Judah, and Samaria, which is Israel, the northern kingdom. So verse 11, Shall I not as I have done unto Samaria... And her idols do so do to Jerusalem and her idols. So he's going, look, this is going to go beyond the northern kingdom. Judah's still not out of the woods. You've got to still repent and improve. 
Verse 12, wherefore, wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. So we got to get this. This is, this is some phenomenal prophecy that Isaiah is giving. Okay. The two, Isra two Israelite kingdoms, the southern kingdom, Judah, northern kingdom, Israel, or Ephraim, it's commonly called. Uh, Assyria, the building up nation, is going to come in big and mighty, wipe them all out, take them out. Judah will be spared. Judah's going to have good times for a while, but because they're still not repenting, they're going to face problems. And Assyria is going to get prideful, and then they're going to get wiped out. Verse 13, for he saith, by the strength of my hand, I have done it, and by my wisdom. So this is, Assyria is going to say, we conquered the nations. God did not help us. We conquered the nations. For I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. There was none that moved the wing, or opened the mouth, or peeped. So pride and selfishness, is there. Assyria is going to feel like they have done this. This is their power. God did not help them do this. Now, verse 15 is a really fascinating uh, analogy, a concept for us to understand that's really important. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Can the axe say, if an axe could speak, would it say, I cut down that tree? Is that correct? No. We would say, excuse me, you didn't cut down that tree by yourself. I used you as a tool to cut that tree down. You just helped. You were the tool, but I did the hard work, basically. He says here, or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? The saw going back and forth. As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. So this is that whole idea of Assyria is a tool in the hand of God. The whole reason Assyria became a phenomenal nation and did what they did is to fulfill the works of God. Yes, there's logical reasoning to look at it and say, well, logically, Assyria did this, this, and this right, and their strategic strategies and battles did this, this, and this, and these other nations did this, this, and this wrong. And logically, that's how it all worked out. I understand that there's logical understanding in here, but what we're learning is that God, this is where that faith comes in, God was working behind the scenes to make it all happen. Now, logical people would say that can't be. That's just impossible. You can't show me that. No, I can't. Because it's not about logic. It's about faith. Having faith in Christ and faith in God, basically. So verse 16, we're going to continue with this metaphor here. Therefore, shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, which means God of war, Send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So he is going to basically take these who are prideful and break them down. Verse 17, And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. And it shall consume the glory of his forest and of the fruit fulfilled, both soul and body. And they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth. So a standard bearer is a guy with a flag in the middle of a battle. And he's got to run around saving the flag and waving it around and doing these things. And he's going to get tired and collapse and fall. And the standard is going to fall. But keeping those flags up there was a good symbol to the army to keep fighting. And so that's what's going to happen. They're going to be consumed and gone in a day. Assyria will be wiped out. Verse 19, and the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. Now, when they say in that day, we're, we're kind of switching to not so much talk as much about the present day of Isaiah but latter days, the last days. So this is a remnant will escape. When they finally realize we need to rely on God, 
and they find the true God and they work on that, then he will help them and it will be amazing for them. Verse 21, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. So even when punishment comes, mercy is available. This is so important, okay? There is a time when we will reach a point of kind of no return. We kind of have to suffer the consequences of our own sins to an extent. But God is there with mercy to help us through those processes. He might not take it away from us, but he is going to help us through that challenging time. That's important for us to always remember. Uh, verse 23, For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb which is another historical event. I don't think we have uh, Judges 7.25. I think we can get into some details on that. And as a rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift up after the manner of Egypt. So this is using Older Testament symbolism to understand that Assyria is going to be wiped out. So even though Assyria is going to march down, take out the northern kingdoms, occupy the area around Jerusalem, Assyria is going to be wiped out. Verse 27, It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So again, overcoming the bondages, overcoming the challenges, being lifted and free, that second coming stuff. Uh, verse 28, He is come to Aeth. He is passed to Migron. At Michmash he have laid up his carriages. They are gone over the passage. They have taken up their lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul is fled. Now, we, we don't know much about these places. In, you know, these are ancient cities that don't exist anymore. Um, but the people in Isaiah's day would know exactly what this means. So this is talking about Israel being freed from Assyria as Assyria gets destroyed, sort of. But that's Israel's, you know, Israel will have a reprieve for a little bit, basically. So verse 30, lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galim, cause it to be heard unto Laish, O poor Anathoth. Mad Mena is removed, the inhabitants of Gebion gather themselves to flee. As yet shall he remain at Nob that day, he shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. So again, Assyria is coming for Israel and Jerusalem, but says for in verse 33, Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lop the bow with terror, and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. So Assyria is going to come and take you guys over and occupy the area, but as powerful as they are, they're going to get prideful, and they're going to fall. They're going to go down. So the, even this isn't just prophesying the destruction of Israel, but the destruction of Assyria is what Isaiah is prophesying here as well. So even further into the future that he's seeing. So let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue our understanding of Isaiah's revelations.